من بعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين المصطفى أبي القاسم محمد الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا الله صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله عليك يا سيدتي ويا مولاتي يا زهراء صلى الله عليك يا بنت رسول الله جعلنا الله من شيعتك ورزقنا الله شفاعتك في الدنيا والآخرة أما بعد فعن جابر بن عبد الله الأنصاري عن فاطمة الزهراء عليها السلام أنها قالت دخل علي أبي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله في بعض الأيام فقال السلام عليك يا فاطمة فقلت وعليك السلام يا أبتا فقال لي يا فاطمة إني أجد في بدني ضعفا فقلت له أعيذك بالله يا أبتاه من الضعف فقال لي يا فاطمة ائتيني بالكساء اليماني فغطيني به فأتيته بالكساء اليماني فغطيته به وصرت أنظر إليه وإذا وجهه يتلألأ كأنه البدر في ليلة تمامه وكماله الله صلى الله عليه محمد وآله 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 فما كانت إلا ساعة وإذا بولد الحسن عليه السلام قد أقبل وقال السلام عليك يا أمة فقلت عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا قرة عيني وثمرة فؤادي فقال لي يا أمة إني أشم عندك رائحة طيبة كأنها رائحة جدي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله فقالت نعم إن جدك تحت الكساء فدنا الحسن عليه السلام نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا جده يا رسول الله أتأذن لي أن أدخل معك تحت الكساء فقال وعليك السلام يا ولدي ويا صاحب حوضي قد أذنت لك فدخل معه تحت الكساء فما كانت إلا ساعة وإذا بولد الحسين عليه السلام قد أقبل وقال السلام عليك يا أمة فقلت عليك السلام يا ولدي ويا قرة عيني وثمرة فؤادي فقال لي يا أمة إني أشم عندك رائحة طيبة كأنها رائحة جدي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله فقلت نعم إن جدك وأخاك تحت الكساء فدنا الحسين عليه السلام نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا جدا السلام عليك يا من اختار الله أتأذن لي أن أكون معكما تحت الكساء فقال وعليك السلام يا ولدي ويا شافع أمتي قد أذنت لك فدخلا معهما تحت الكساء فعند ذلك أقبل أبو الحسن علي بن أبي طالب عليه السلام وقال 
السلام عليك يا بنت رسول الله فقلت عليك السلام يا أبا الحسن ويا أمير المؤمنين فقال لي يا فاطمة إني أشم عندك رائحة طيبة كأنها رائحة أخي وابن عمي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله فقلت نعم ها هو مع ولديك تحت الكساء فأقبل علي عليه السلام نحو الكساء وقال السلام عليك يا رسول الله أتأذن لي أن أكون معكم تحت الكساء فقال وعليك السلام يا أخي ووصي وخليفتي وصاحب لوائي قد أذنت لك فدخل علي عليه السلام تحت الكساء ثم أتيت نحو الكساء وقلت السلام عليك يا أبتاه يا رسول الله أتأذن لي أن أكون معكم تحت الكساء فقال صلى الله عليه وآله وعليك السلام يا بنتي ويا بضعتي قد أذنت لك فدخلت تبعهم تحت الكساء فلما اكتملنا جميعا تحت الكساء أخذ أبي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله بطرفي الكساء وأومأ بيده اليمنى إلى السماء وقال اللهم هؤلاء أهل بيتي وخاصتي وحامتي لحمهم دحمي ودمهم دمي يؤلمني ما يؤلمهم ويحزنني ما يحزنهم أنا حرب لمن حاربهم وولي لمن والاهم وعدو لمن عاداهم وسلم لمن سالمهم ومحب لمن أحبهم إنهم مني وأنا منهم فاجعل صلواتك وبركاتك ورحمتك وغفرانك ورضوانك علي وعليهم وأذهب عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا الله صلى الله عليه محمد ورحمة فقال الله عز وجل يا ملائكتي ويا سكان سماواتي إني ما خلقت سماء مبنية ولا أرضا مدحية ولا قمرا منيرا ولا شمسا مضيئا ولا فلك يدور ولا بحرا يجري ولا فلكا يسري إلا في محبة هؤلاء الخمسة الذين هم تحت الكساء فقال الأمين جبرائيل عليه السلام يا رب ومن تحت الكساء فقال عز وجل هم أهل بيت النبوة ومعدن الرسالة هم فاطمة وأبوها وبعلها وبنوها الله صلى على محمد وعلى محمد فقال جبرائيل عليه السلام يا رب أتأذن لي أن أهبط إلى الأرض لأكون معهم سادسا فقال عز وجل نعم قد أذنت لك فهبط الأمين جبرائيل عليه السلام وقال السلام عليك يا رسول الله العلي الأعلى يقرئك السلام ويخصك بالتحية والإكرام ويقول لك وعزتي وجلالي إني ما خلقت سماء مبنية ولا أرضا مدحية ولا قمرا منيرا ولا شمسا مضيئة ولا فلك يدور ولا بحر يجري ولا فلك يسري إلا لأجلكم ومحبتكم وقد أذن لي أن أدخل معكم فهل تأذن لي يا رسول الله فقال صلى الله عليه وآله وعليك السلام يا أمين وحي الله إنه نعم قد أذنت لك فدخل جبرائيل عليه السلام معنا تحت الكساء 
ثم التفت إلى أبي فقال إن الله قد أوحى إليكم يقول إنما يريد الله ليذهب عنكم الرجس أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا فقال علي عليه السلام لأبي يا رسول الله أخبرني ما لجلوسنا هذا تحت الكساء من الفضل عند الله فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله والذي بعثني بالحق نبيا واصطفاني بالرسالة نجيا ما ذكر خبرنا هذا في محفل من محافل أهل الأرض وفيه جمع من شيعتنا ومحبينا إلا ونزلت عليهم الرحمة وحفت بهم الملائكة واستغفرت لهم إلى أن يتفرقوا فقال علي عليه السلام إذا والله فزنا وفاز شيعتنا ورب الكعبة فقال أبي رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله يا علي والذي بعثني بالحق نبيا واصطفاني بالرسالة نجيا ما ذكر خبرنا هذا في محفل من محافل أهل الأرض وفيه جمع من شيعتنا ومحبينا وفيهم مهموم إلا وفرج الله همه ولا مغموم إلا وكشف الله غمه ولا طالب حاجة إلا وقضى الله حاجته فقال علي عليه السلام إذا والله فزنا وسعدنا وكذلك شيعتنا فازوا وسعدوا في الدنيا والآخرة ورب الكعبة الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Last night we began a brief lesson or a look at this beautiful hadith narrated to us by Fatima al-Zahra sallallahu wa sallamuhu alayha through the means of Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari. And last night we very briefly touched upon some of the theological aspects with regards to this hadith where we mentioned that in order for something to come into existence for something to become into being, four requirements are necessary. We said the first requirement is what? Do you guys remember, some of you? First requirement in order to have something come into existence. The material, exactly. You must have the material. And the example we used of a pulpit. We said you want to make a pulpit, you must have the material, the wood, for example. What else? The? The plan, exactly. You must have the plan. You bring a carpenter, the best carpenter in the world, but maybe he's never heard of what a pulpit is, for example. You tell him, I want you to make me a pulpit. He tells you, what's a pulpit? I don't know. I've never seen a pulpit in my life before. I don't know what. I've never heard of that word in my life before. What is it? So you have to bring the picture in his mind somehow. Either show him a picture, draw him a picture, make him a plan. He must have an understanding of what is he making. Okay. So that is necessary to have something come into existence. The plan. And then the third component is of course you need what? The doer. The person who is doing it. You need the carpenter for example in this case. To put it together for you. Without the carpenter you won't have a pulpit. For example. The person who does the action. And fourth. And we said the last one is what? The purpose. The purpose. What is the purpose? There has to be a purpose for it. Now the purpose may vary from one person to other person. The carpenter's purpose, for example, could be just to make an income, make some profit. Whereas the person who is commissioning the, the carpenter, who is paying him, his purpose could be to bring thawab, to have thawab, for example. Qurbatan illallah ta'ala. So there is a purpose. We said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to this universe, to this world, obviously He is the creator. He creates the material. That's one. Two, he already has a plan. He does not need to see a plan like the way we do. You bring the best engineer in the world today. You tell him, make me a building. 
Can he just go ahead and put the bricks together? He won't. What he'll do is he'll make a plan. He'll design a map. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need to design a map. Does not need to make a plan. He creates it right there from the beginning. And that's why it's called in the sermon of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam, she uses the word ansha'a. Ansha'a. Insha'a means that you create from nothing. New innovation. You create. Insha'a. So he creates the material. He creates the plan. He is the one who's doing the action. Either directly or by ordering the angels, for example. But still at his order, his command. So he's doing the action. But the reason, why? What is the reason for all this to come into existence? According to this hadith, this whole universe was created. Moon, sun, the orbits and the planets and the earth and the, and the skies. All illa fi mahabbati ha'ula il khamsati alladheena hum tahta al kisa. That Allah salli ala Muhammad wa alim Muhammad. For the love of those five who are under the cloak. You know, this is the reason for the creation of the universe. Okay. Having looked at that, today we'll take a look at a different aspect. Briefly again for the time that we have, we'll take a look at some of the juristic aspects of this hadith. In Islam, of course, we have laws, Islamic laws. And the fuqaha, when they try to come up with the laws, what they turn first and foremost is the Holy Quran. Quran is the first thing they turn to. Okay. If the Quran talks about it, it's found in the Quran, easy. Eating pork, for example. Someone says, am I allowed to eat pork or am I not allowed to eat pork? Okay. Easy. The faqih comes, picks up the Quran, looks for it in the Quran. What does the Quran say? It's not allowed. It's haram. So easy. He, then he turns to the person and says, it's haram. You can't have it. Okay. But there are only 500 verses in the Quran that talk about ahkam. Ahkam has over 6,000 verses. Uh, sorry, the Quran has over 6,000 verses. Only 500. Talk about ahkam. Okay. Well, if he can't find it in the Quran, what does the faqih do then? He turns to the sunnah. In the school thought of Ahlul Bayti, alayhim salam, we have the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alih, as well as the sunnah of the imams and Fatima al-Zahra sallallahu alayhi wa so, Allah salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Remember what I said last night about the salawat? You know, I'd, maybe the lesson was not learned very well. So, let's, let's try this. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Much better. Yeah. Good, alhamdulillah. Inshallah, the hypocrisy is being removed from our hearts, inshallah. Now, he turns to the sunnah of the Prophet and Fatima al-Zahra and the Imams alayhim salam All 14 ma'asumeen. The sunnah could be something that they say. It could be something that they do. Or it could be someone doing an action in their presence and they do not protest against it. Okay? That's something important. Someone does an action in the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and the Prophet does not say, no, this is not allowed. You should not be doing this. If he doesn't say so, then we know, the faqih would know, this action is permitted. Because the Prophet permitted it. Otherwise, he would have said something. Same thing with the Imams, alayhim salam For example, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, went by the people who were mourning and weeping for the martyrs of Uhud. The women were weeping, crying. They were showing off their grief for the martyrs of Uhud. The Prophet ﷺ did not stop them. Did not say this is haram. This is not allowed. But rather he said, what about my uncle Al-Hamza? Isn't there anyone to weep for him? So this means not only did he approve of it, 
He actually wanted it to be done for his uncle Al Hamza, Salamullah alayhi. So that is what the faqih would do. Now there are other tools, other resources the faqih would use, but we'll stop here for now for the sake of time. So he would turn for the sunnah. Sunnah is very important. The hadith of the prophets, imams alayhim salam and that's something interesting in the school thought of Ahlul Bayt, brothers and sisters, alayhim salam The Sunni brothers, they use similar idea. The only difference is that they stop at the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa For us, we have an additional 250 years of sunnah, approximately. An additional 250 years after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa who are the imams alayhim salam the imams. And that's why you have a wealth of knowledge about different scenarios and different things happening. When a faqih comes to hadith al-kisa, a person can also derive laws. For example, can a man who is not a mahram to a woman speak to her and hear her voice? A man who is not mahram to a woman, can he have a conversation with her? and hear her voice speaking to him? And the answer is yes, he can. How do we know that? Who narrated the hadith of Kisa? Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari. We read this, An Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari. Where did he learn it from? An Fatima al-Zahra alayha salam This means, Fatima salamullahi alayha. She was the one talking to Jabir ibn Abdullah al-Ansari Rudwanullahi ta'ala alayh but she was talking to him in the professional level she's teaching him she's teaching him this hadith so that he can spread the hadith and it can reach us in fact yesterday or last night if you remember I mentioned the hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi told Jabir that you will see my grandson Imam al-Baqir my great-grandson, Imam al-Baqir, you'll see him. Remember this hadith? When Imam al-Baqir salam saw Jabir, when he saw him, he asked him, he said, tell me, ya Jabir, what did you see in the book that my grandmother Fatima was writing? She has a special book that some people criticize us Shia. They say, you have Mus'haf. Fatima, Mus'haf Fatima. And hence they criticize the Shia, they say they have another Quran and it's called Mus'haf Fatima, Mus'haf. Okay. If you ever get across such a criticism, here is what you say. First of all, what does the word Mus'haf in the Arabic language mean? The word Mus'haf in the Arabic language means a bunch of leaflets that are put together. That's what Mus'haf in the Arabic language means. Leaflets that are put together. Okay? That's what Mus'haf means. Over the time, over the time, the word started to be referring to only what? The Quran. Over time, people started to refer to the Qur'an as a mushaf. Because it's what? It's leaflets, it's paper that's put together. So the word mushaf started to be used mostly for Qur'an. But in the Arabic language, it did not mean this. I'll give you an example from the Qur'an. Today, today, if you talk to any Arab person, and we have a few of them here, ask them, what does the word sayyara mean in Arabic? What does Sayyara mean? Those of you who know Arabic. Sayyara means what? Car. Car, the vehicle that you drive. In the Quran, in Surah Yusuf, Allah says, وَجَاءَتْ سَيَّارَةً فَأَرْسَلُوا وَارِدَهُمْ وَجَاءَتْ سَيَّارَةً What does that mean? A car came? The Arabic word for Sayyara is a caravan al qafil al lati tasir the caravan that walks that walks in the desert 
That's what the word sayyara in the Arabic language means. Over time, today, when you say the word sayyara, no one thinks of a caravan that is walking in the desert anymore. Everyone thinks of a car. Does mean that mean the Quran when it's talking now, it's talking about a vehicle? That's nonsense. In fact, any man who has some sense of logic would never say this. If you have to understand the word, you have to go back in its roots. What does the word mean in Arabic? The word mushaf, it means leaflets put together. That's what it used to mean. And so mushaf Fatima is writing that Fatima salamullahi alayha used to put together. Where did she get that from? According to the ahadith for us, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, Jibra'il alayhi salam used to dictate to her. He used to dictate to her. She was muhaddatha. That's one of the names of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. Muhaddatha. Muhaddatha means the angels speak to her. The angels spoke to Maryam salam Allah alayha. Right? فَأَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشَرًا سَوِيَّا قَالَتْ إِنِّي أَعُوذُ بِالرَّحْمَانِ مِنْكَ إِنْ كُنْتَ تَقِيَّا قَالَ He said, he replied, Maryam saw the angel and she spoke to him and he spoke back to her and he told her that you, you will become a mother of a person who will become rahma, a mercy. She had a conversation. Maryam was ma'asuma but she was not a prophet. Of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fatima salamullahi alayha is ma'asumah. And she's not a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the angels can speak to her. That is Mus'haf Fatima. It is not the Quran. Not the Quran. And our Imams were asked, What does Mus'haf Fatima contain? They said, It does not contain anything of your Quran, of the Quran. Nothing of the Quran. The Quran that we have, all Muslims agree, this is the Quran that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. This is the Quran. Nonetheless, this noble lady, this virtuous lady, Mus'haf Fatima, was given to her. Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam asked Jabir, he said, tell me, what did you see in the Mus'haf of Fatima? He said, one day I went to see her and she had that book in it, she told me, I saw it. She said, he, she said to me, this contains the names of all our Shia. All our Shia. From this day on till the day of judgment. All are in here. And Al-Mufaddal ibn Amr, he says, I went to see Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam. One day, he picked up a piece of paper, a long document. And he told me, Ya Mufaddal, here is your name in our Shia, amongst our Shia. Now I don't know if you and I are on that list. I don't know if we are. But inshallah we are. Inshallah we are. The hadith says, Fatima salamullahi alayha was named Fatima because she فَطَمَتْ شِيَعَتَهَا وَمُحَبِّيهَا مِنْ نَارِ جَهَنَّمْ Because she has distanced her Shia and her lovers from the fire of Jahannam. Inshallah we're amongst them. So basically what we see is that a man is allowed to speak to a woman who is not a mahram. But within the boundaries of the Sharia, boundaries of Sharia. He cannot be sitting down with her and laughing and joking and ha 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 and he 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 and all this funny thing and this is not allowed. Within the boundaries of the Sharia, things that are professional about a particular project, about a particular thing, in a place where they're not, you know, on their own, they can do whatever they want, say whatever they want. No, within the boundaries of the Sharia, and this applies to also online as well. Online, the same rules. Some people think just because I'm online, I can say whatever I want. Because he is not next to me or she is not next to me. That's not the case. 
the same rules apply within the boundaries of the Sharia. That's allowed. Second, when Imam Al Hassan Salamullah came to see his mother Salamullah alayha, he said, Assalamu alayki ya Ummah. The Prophet came said, Assalamu alayki ya Fatima. Okay. It's mustahab to say salam. Mustahab. It brings harmony to the community, to the society. When a man goes to say salamu alaykum, a woman comes to say salamu alaykum. Saying salam is mustahab. Replying is wajib. It's mandatory to reply. Even if someone is in the state of salat, someone is praying, a person walks into the house, he doesn't know that you are praying, he doesn't realize you're praying. He says so and so, salamu alaykum. And you're in the state of salat, you have to respond. You also say the same, he says. He says, Salamu alaykum. You say, Salamu alaykum. And you continue with your salat, wherever you are in the salat. You're in the ruku' you say, Subhana Rabbi al Azimi wa bihamdi. He comes, Salamu alaykum. You say, Salamu alaykum. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Sami Allahu liman ham, for example. Okay? You continue with it. Whatever he says, you reply. Now, if there are others as well, then you don't have to. If he says salam and there are five people sitting, for example, one of them has to respond. If one of them responds, that's enough. Okay? So salam is mustahab, but the, the return of the salam is wajib. It brings peace and harmony into the community. Second or third, he says, my mother, I smell a beautiful fragrance in the house. And I talked about this. But he did not jump to the conclusion. What did he say? He said, it appears to be like the fragrance of my grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Right? It appears to be. He did not jump to conclusion. How many of us in the community, in the society, the minute we hear something, we immediately jump to the conclusion. This is what probably is happening. This is what's going on. And how many times this has created problems in the community, in the society, when people jump to conclusions. Wait, investigate. Imam Amir al muminin Salamullah alayhi says, between haq and batil are four fingers. He was asked, kam bayna al haq wal batil? What is the distance between truth and falsehood? He said four fingers and he went like this. He said hearing and seeing. That's the difference. Between haqq and batil. I heard this and this is going on. Investigate. Make sure. And even if you find someone doing something, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not like it. For a person to go and, you know this person that we see at the mosque, he comes every night, he every day he prays, everything. You know, the other day I saw him doing this, this, this. This is haram, this is ghiba. Ghiba. It's backbiting. The only time when Allah likes people to speak against an issue is against a zalim, an oppressor. Someone who does zulm, zulm, an oppressor. Speak against him. Say to the people that this person is a zalim. We have to stand in his face. Okay. But to expose a mu'min, to expose someone, is not allowed. It's not allowed. All these lessons we learn from this dua, this hadith. And then in this hadith, we learn another beautiful lesson. Dua, dua. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa when all his family members were under the cloak, he raises his right hand and he prays, Allahumma ha'ulai ahlu bayti wa khasati wa hamati lahmuhum lahmi wa damuhum dami yu'limuni ma yu'limuhum wa yahzununi ma yahzunuhum and he prays the dua until he says, فَاجْعَلْ صَلَوَاتِكَ وَبَرَكَاتِكَ وَرَحْمَتَكَ وَغُفْرَانَكَ وَرِضْوَانَكَ عَلَيَّ وَعَلَيْهِمْ وَأَذْهِبْ عَنْهُمْ الرِّجْسَ وَطَهِرْهُمْ تَطْهِيرًا Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم
dua. It's important, brothers and sisters, that we teach ourselves and we teach our children that every time you are faced with a problem, we turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Turn to Allah. The other day I was reading in the newspaper, maybe about a week or two ago, two or one or two weeks ago, I was reading in the paper. They approximate somewhere, anywhere from 37 to 49 percent of the youth, of the youth, teenagers, inflict self harm on themselves. Inflicting self harm. This is people who cannot commit suicide. They're, they're afraid to commit suicide, but what they do is they harm themselves. The percentage is now increasing. The doctors are saying one of the reasons for this is these children, these teenagers, are feeling depressed. And hence, what is happening? They're reacting this way. And also, the percentage of those committing suicide, teenagers, 15, 16 years old, this is also on the rise. Why? How come? Why would a person feel depressed? They don't have hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's important to teach ourselves and our children. Whenever you are in difficulty, turn to Allah. Turn to Allah. We read in Surah Al-Dahar Al-Insan, the reason for the revelation of the Surah is because when Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein alayhim salam became ill, Fatima salam Allah alayhi and Amir al-Mu'min alayhi salam made another, a vow. Ya Allah, if you cure them, we will fast for three consecutive days. What are they teaching the children? Whenever a problem arises, turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It does not mean one should not take his medication. No, of course not. You take the medicine. The hadith says one of the prophets became ill and he said, Ya Allah, Min kadda wa min kashifa. You're the one who gave me the illness, so I will wait for the cure from you, Ya Allah, as well. Allah replied to this prophet. He said, true, I can give you the shifa, but I also created dawa, the medicine. You take the medicine, and then I'll take care of the rest, inshallah. You take the medicine first. There are means. Allah created means. Allah created the medicine. We might get a headache someday, but he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of His mercy created us some medication to treat it, to help us with it. But even then, one should not give up hope from Allah. And that's why you find Imam al Hussein sallallahu alayhi when he saw his parents doing this in front of him, fasting for three days because of a vow, of another. He sees his grandfather Rasulullah making dua. Allahumma. Ha'ula ahli bayti. On the day of Ashura. On the day of Ashura. When he saw it is said just after praying Salatul Fajr with his companions. He saw the enemies. And the hadith says it's, they looked like the flood. 30,000 at least of them coming. He turns to Allah. A beautiful dua, beautiful dua. He says, Allahumma anta thiqati fi kulli karb wa rajai fi kulli shiddah wa anta li fi kulli amrin nazala bi thiqatu wa uddah kam min hammin yadhufu fihi al-fuad wa taqillu fihi al-heelah ويخذل فيه الصديق ويشمت فيه العدو أنزلته بك وشكوته إليك رغبة مني إليك عمن سواك ففرجته عني وكشفته عني Oh Allah, how many difficulties I have come across in my life. 
how many situations of distress where people would desert me my heart becomes weak enemies would laugh at me and mock me but in such situations I turn to you ya Allah and how many times you've relieved me of my difficulties and here I am again turning to you ya Allah the trust in Allah Oh Allah, Allahumma anta thiqati. You're my trust in every difficulty and my hope in every calamity. This is an important lesson. Always turn to Allah in every difficulty. And there is a beautiful salat known as the salat of al-istighatha in Fatima al-Zahra alayha salam Salat al-istighatha. You pray two rak'at salat, just like Salatul Fajr. The niyyah is I'm praying two rak'at, Salatul Istighatha, seeking help from Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam. You pray two rak'at, qurbatan ila Allah ta'ala. Then you put your forehead on the turbah, on the muhr, and you say 100 times, Ya Mawlati. Ya Sayyidati, Ya Mawlati, Ya Fatima tu Aghithini. Ya Sayyidati, Ya Mawlati, Ya Fatima tu Aghithini. Hundred times. Then you put your right cheek on the muhr and you say it another one hundred times. Then you put your left cheek and you say it another one hundred times. Then you put your forehead and say it another one hundred and ten times. So total it is how many times? Four hundred ten times. And then you pray for your hajj. The ulama say when you pray the salat out of desperation, when you're desperate, when you feel all the doors are closed, the door of Allah is open, you pray the salat. Pray the salat. Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam used to pray in the middle of the night in the Kaaba. Tawus al-Yamani says, I used to go to the Kaaba at the time of Hajj, it's busy, so I used to go at night. One night I went and I heard a voice doing sujood, praying. I heard it carefully, I saw it as Imam al-Sajjad alayhi salam, in the darkness of the night. Late in the night when the stars start to disappear from the sky. About maybe an hour or two before Fajr, when the stars disappear. He said, Oh Allah! At this time, the stars have disappeared from your skies. People are sleeping. Kings have closed their gates and they have kept guards protecting them. But at this time, your gate is open, Ya Allah. This is the time when your gate is open. Ilahi gharat nujumu samawatik wa namat uyunu anamik وَغَلَّقَتُ الْمُلُوكُ أَبْوَابَهَا وَجَعَلَتْ عَلَيْهَا حُجَّابَهَا وَبَابُكَ مَفْتُوحٌ لِلسَّائِلِينَ At this time, your door is open, so I've come to you. The person goes to Allah, prays to Allah. فاطمة الزهراء سلام الله عليها did this. But because she dedicated her life for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because she was looking after the truth, the haqq feeling the pain for the deviation caused in the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa she stood to the first man, the first khalifa in her sermon and she explicitly said to him O oh son of Fulan is it according to the book of Allah that you can inherit your father but I cannot inherit mine? Or you have deliberately neglected the words of the Quran and put them behind your back? What does it mean when she says you've neglected the words of the Quran? You are manipulating the Quran the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. clear manipulation, clear distortion of the sunnah. 
At that time, you know, when you have a straight line, brothers and sisters, when the another line comes out, at the beginning, the distance between those two lines is small. But as that line grows, what happens between those two distances? They start growing bigger and bigger. That deviation started then. Fatima Salamullah Aliha tried to stop it. Tried. And she got killed, Salamullah Aliha, doing so. But look where we are today. Look where the Muslims are today. Where that deviation has resulted in today. Where you have Muslims going into the masjid to kill other Muslims. And they think that this is an act that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wal'iyadu billah. Look where we are now. It started from back then. When Khalid ibn al-Walid killed Malik ibn Nuwayrah radhwanullahi ta'ala alayh unjustly, unfairly. He killed him. And he married his wife on the same night. And the first Khalifa did nothing to him. Nothing. That deviation, we see what's happening today. Because of trying to stop this, so she, salamullahi alayha, went through all this pain. Asma says, I was with Amir al Mu'mineen, salamullahi alayhi. As he was washing the body of Fatima Salamullahi alayha. Then when he finished the wash, he turned to the corner of the room and he started crying out loudly. I told him, Sayyidi, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, you're the one who taught us patience. How can I see you losing the patience over the loss of Fatima alayha salam? He said, Ya Asma, ya Inna ala sabri Fatima la sabir, Inna ala faqdi Fatima la sabirun. We are patient over the loss of Fatima, O oh Asma. Then what is the matter, Mawla, Ya Amir al Mu'mini? He said, Ya Asma, I just saw her broken rib. All this time she did not tell me about it, Ya Asma. Ya. That's what made me cry. That's what made me weep out loudly. Then he wanted to tie the kafan of Fatima, Salamullahi alayha. He called, Ya Hassan, Ya Hussein, Ya Zainab, Wa Ya Umma Kulthum. Come and bid the last farewell with your mother Fatima, for this is the last time we see her in dunya, until we are reunited again in Jannah. Amir al Mu'mineen, Salamullahi alayhi, says, I saw Imam al Hassan alayhi salam throwing himself on the body of his mother Fatima and he cried, Umma ya 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 ana waladuk al Hassan ajibini. I am your son Hassan, respond to me. Then he says, I saw Al Hussein alayhi salam throwing himself on the body of his mother and he cried, Umma ya ana waladuk al Hussein ajibini. I am your son Hussein, respond to me. Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam says, I bear witness. I saw Fatima weeping at that instant, and she raised her arms and embraced her two orphans until I heard a cry from the sky calling me, Ya Ali. Irfa'huma falakad abkaya kulla malaikat al sama. Raise them from the body of their mother Fatima, for all the angels are weeping and crying for these two orphans. Ah, 
That is why that pain was remaining in the heart of Ahlul Bayt, remaining in the heart of Abi Abdullah. It is said when he fell on the plains of Karbala, heavily wounded, Zainab alayhi salam came to him. She rushed to him. She looked at him. She said, Akhi Aba Abdullah, if you have died, then Amruka wa Amruna ila Allah. Then we leave our command to Allah's command. But if you are still alive, then respond to your sister Zainab. It is said he was in such weakness, in such difficulty, he couldn't. Then she turned to him and she said, Akhi Aba Abdullah. عليك بأمنا فاطمة إلا ما أجبتني I ask you with your love to our mother Fatima that you respond to me if you are still alive. Then Abi Abdullah alayhi salam opened his eyes. He said, Zayna, you cut my heart into pieces. Why did you mention the name of our mother Fatima? What this suggests is that all those swords, all those arrows, all those fears in the body of Abi Abdullah, all of them were easy compared to the pain of his mother Fatima Salamullah alayha. He said, Zainab, go back to the tent and take care of my children and my women. She did so. She ran back to the tent crying, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Wa sayalamu alladheena zalamu ayya munqalabi yanqalibun. Wal aqibatu lil muttaqeen. Brothers and sisters, let's raise our hands for dua. We are the guests of Fatima al Zahra, salamullahi alayha. Insha'Allah, dua is accepted at this moment. A'udhu billahi min ash shaytan ar rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Amma yujibu al mudtar idha da'a wa yakshifu al su'u. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دا ويكشف السوء اللهم إنا نسألك وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم الأعز الأجل الأكرم يا الله 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 إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها اكشف عنا السوء يا الله اللهم اغفر ذنوبنا كفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار يا الله مع محمد وآله الأطهار يا الله اللهم بالزهراء فاطمة اجعلنا وذريتنا إلى يوم الدين من شيعة الزهراء المتقين يا الله ومن خدمة الزهراء المخلصين يا الله اللهم بالزهراء فاطمة انصر شيعة الزهراء في مشارق الأرض ومغاربها يا الله اللهم واقض حوائج المؤمنين والمؤمنات شاف وعاف جميع مرضى المؤمنين والمؤمنات على الخصوص من أوصونا بالدعاء منهم اللهم ألبسهم لباس العافية واقض حوائجهم وشاف مرضاهم ويرحمهم في أوطانهم وديارهم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين رب اغفر لي ولوالدي وارحمهما كما ربياني صغيرا اجزهما بالإحسان إحسانا وبالسيئات غفرانا رب اجعلني مقيم الصلاة ومن ذريتي ربنا وتقبل دعاء 
اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج واجعلنا من شيعته وأنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يده اللهم كل لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا حتى تسكنه أرضك وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم أرنا الطلعة الرشيدة والغرة الحميدة واكحل أنظارنا بنظرة منا إليه اللهم نقسم عليك بالزهراء فاطمة سلام الله عليها إلا ما رزقتنا شفاعة الزهراء في الدنيا وفي القبر وفي الآخرة يا الله يا الله يا الله لقضاء الحوائج ولشفاء المرضى ولكشف هذه الغم عن هذه الأمة ولتعجيل فرج مولانا صاحب العصر والزمان وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات على الخصوص أرواح موات الجالسين والحاضرين especially for the روح of مرحوم محمد حسين مالك المرحوم سيد انتصار الحسن رحم الله من يقرأ السورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات